Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for joining us for the latest Julia Hub webinar, Introduction to Modeling Toolkit for Industrial Modelers, a hands-on training. I'm Mishra St. Amand. I'm the head of marketing for Julia Hub. And today I'm joined by three of our modeling and simulation experts, Brad Carmen, Michael Tiller, and Chris Rakakis. As this is a hands-on webinar, we shared instructions via email to access modeling toolkit. You can find a copy of those instructions in the URL I shared in the chat if you haven't already prepped and downloaded those things. Um, now, before we get started, I'm going to give you a quick introduction to the team behind today's webinar. Our presenter is Brad Carmen. He's the Director of Consulting Services for Julia, and until very recently, he served as a mechanical engineer at Instron, specializing in system modeling with a focus on model and software development for the crash simulation system. Um, there's actually, he provided recently a great webinar on his experience um, with that that I highly recommend. Um, also joining us today is Michael Tiller. He's also a relatively new addition to Julia Hub, but not modeling and simulation. He's the Senior Director of Product Management for Julia Sim, but you may know him as one of the contributors to the Modelica Modeling Language, creator of Modelica University, and author of two books, including Modelica by Example. And then we have Chris Rakakis, Julia Hub's Vice President of Modeling and Simulation, as well as a uh, uh, thought leader and advocate for scientific machine learning. And he will be in the background helping to answer your questions via chat and popping in here and there. Um, to add additional information as Brad goes through the example uh, um, system he's set up but to discuss. So um, thank you again for joining us. Um, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A and we will answer them as we go along. Um, depending on what they are, Brad will, we, we will, I will jump in or, or one of us will jump in to ask him or if they're just set up questions, you know, we'll, we'll be answering those. And the one question that always is one of the first ones we get is, will we be sharing a recording? And yes, we'll share a recording and any supporting materials with anyone who's registered for the webinar. Um, and it'll come over in the next few days. So now I'll turn things over to Brad. Thank you, Misha. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to a webinar on modeling toolkits, which is one of my most favorite uh, topics. So. Let me go ahead and share my screen. And uh, we'll go over a couple slides here to get started to set the stage. Uh, and then we're going to go into some hands on coding. So, first, let me just kind of give an overview of what is Julia Hub, what is Julia Sim. Um, I won't go into the details of Julia because presumably if you're coming here to learn about modeling toolkit, you know what Julia is. Um, but that is where the whole story starts. Uh, the foundation of what modeling toolkit is built on is of course Julia. And it is one of the things that attracted me to modeling toolkit is that Julia is such a strong foundation. And if you're gonna be building models, then it's really nice to be doing it in such a great language that allows you to do things with your models. And so that's pretty much what Julia Hub is, is about, is building up the enterprise layer to help you do uh, and more useful things with your models. And so the base layer here is the programming language and modeling toolkit. These are the open source components that allow you to build the foundation of what you're trying to do. And the top layer here is the enterprise layer that Julia Hub is actively working on building up. So you can do things like controls or surrogatizing your models uh, or providing libraries that are um, advanced libraries for getting helping you get your work done. There's a, a lot to say here. Um, I don't want to go too too deep into it, but just to go over these three bullet points. As I said, the foundation is open source, but combined with Julia Hub, you have, you have I think, what is a good sweet spot uh, for moving forward with, with your project. You know that you, you're not going to get burned by a new release. Um, you have this open source uh, ability to be able to take control of what you're working on. Uh, but at the same time, you have Julia Hub there to provide enterprise support so that you can uh, you know, have 
have some hands there, experts that can help you when, when you're in a pinch and developing tools that can also help you. Uh, the other bullet point here is that modeling toolkit is an ACAUSA modeling system. There are many other ACAUSA modeling systems out there, but there is something very unique about modeling toolkit. Leveraging the power of Julia, uh, we have something called Julia Sim Compiler, which is helping break the barriers of the scalability that modeling toolkit, that an ACAUSA modeling system has. Um, we just did a webinar on that last week. I, I suggest any after this webinar, if, if you'd like to learn more about that, um, that's, that's a good next step. Uh, and finally, um, in today's world of machine learning, uh, this is where modeling toolkit and SciML really uh, excel, is being able to mix physical models with data. So we're not producing just purely pure neural network models. Uh, we're not producing just pure physics-based models. We have the ability to combine them both together. And that gives, uh, as Chris can show in many um, uh, past talks, that this can is what really allows you to, to get to the next level of modeling excellence. So that's enough said about all that. Um, let's move to, to what this is all about, talking about modeling toolkit. So um, just a quick outline of what we're going to talk about. First, I'm going to give you um, a problem description that is a real life mechanical engineering problem that um, I, I actually had to do something very similar in, in a past life. So this is, a I think, a pretty good example to, to prove out the capability of how you can use this tool to solve real life problems. We're going to start with some math just to set the stage, because that's what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing math in this, in this seminar. And what we're going to do first with that math is solve a steady state problem, um, which is basically just doing some set of, solving a set of equations. And then we're going to move to solving that same set of equations in time, so running an actual time-based simulation. And in modeling toolkit terminology, that's called a nonlinear system. That's when no time is involved. And whenever you're going to introduce some kind of change in time, that's called an ODE system. That stands for ordinary differential equations. Um, that also includes DAEs, differential algebraic equations. Uh, you don't need to know too much about what that means, because modeling toolkit will really worry about all that for you. Uh, we're going to first solve an incompressible, incompressible system and then move to a compressible system. And the difference between these two in fluid dynamics is, is very vast. Uh, but I'm going to show how easy it is to get from one to the next. And um, the code for what I'm going to be talking about is posted here online in a Git repository so that you can easily copy paste uh, and, and follow along with me. OK, so uh, the problem that we're going to solve here is uh, a hydraulic system. What I'm showing here on the screen is a hydraulic press, which um, is it could be doing a number of functions. But let's pretend that what we have here is a very high pressure system that can produce a ton of force and an actuator that could move very quickly. And so that's what this gray uh, blob represents here is, is an actuator, which has pressure on one side, a high pressure on one side, and a lower pressure on the other side. Um, and out, outside of the screen would be some kind of uh, control system that is able to move the pressures in and out of this actuator and move it up and down. And for a machine like this, you might imagine that it's going to be doing something. It's going to be pressing something, compressing something, or maybe it's going to be uh, actuating something else. Uh, but regardless, it's going to have to have some kind of human interaction. Somebody's going to have to put something in it. And that's what this little hand represents, is that uh, there's going to be live pressure, but a human interaction at the same time. So there's a safety concern. If, if there were some 
failure of the control system and all of a sudden an enormous amount of pressure rushed in here, this thing could close instantly and crush someone's hand. And so that's, that's the problem that we're gonna focus on here today. And the concept that we have to solve that problem, to make it foolproof that, so that that accident, accident could never happen is we're gonna introduce an orifice upstream of the actuator so that the velocity can't get too high, right? It's just a, 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 some resistance that ensures that the, the oil rushing in here can never go too fast. The pressure can't climb too quickly and this can't move to, to some desired velocity. So that is what we're gonna do is we're gonna say we want to hit a specific max velocity. What is the <clears throat> orifice size that will achieve that? So let's get into the math real quick so that we can set the stage of the problem that we're going to solve. So, so let's say we've done some research to find uh, an, a manufacturer that creates orifices of certain sizes, uh, and they give you an equation that looks like this, that tells you exactly what is the pressure drop across that orifice. And uh, this equation is, uh, maybe not exactly what would be in real life, but it's it's representative enough for us to solve this problem. So essentially what we have is pressure drop is a function of the velocity uh, of the liquid or the hydraulic fluid uh, times some coefficient. And that velocity is going to be of the fluid is a function of the orifice size. And the Q represents the flow rate the flow rate is gonna be determined based on the movement of the actuator. So basically the area of the actuator times its velocity, that's gonna give you the um, flow rate in and out of the actuator. So starting from that, we know what the flow rate is. Uh, we know what the fluid velocity through the orifice is. We can figure out what the pressure drop is. So that's the first equation we need to know. The second equation we need to know is about the forces on the actuator. So if we do a free body diagram, we have the pressure pushing up on the actuator, we have the pressure pushing down, and we have a damper there as well that is also giving a downward force. And we define X as pointing up. Uh, so that's the positive uh, direction. So, so this is a negative force, this is a negative force, this is a positive force. So putting all that together, uh, these are all the details. Um, and putting all that together, this is what you get. So essentially we have four a system of four equations to describe this incompressible flow system. So like I said, the goal is to solve what is an orifice area that we need to purchase from a supplier to ensure that the actuator velocity does not exceed one meter per second. So let's just say that that's our target, one meter per second. So this is the, in this case, we have the four equations. Our input is going to be the actuator velocity, and we want to solve for the orifice area. So we have four equations. We need to solve for, therefore, four things, right? That's the rule. Anytime you have a set of equations, the number of equations should equal the number of unknowns, right? So I've highlighted what the unknowns are in this case. We have the orifice area. That's the one we're really after. But we also need to figure out what is the fluid velocity that results from that, and then what are the two pressures in these two chambers that result from that as well. And we are solving a steady state problem. So we're just kind of assuming that this is just moving at a velocity and therefore the acceleration, we're setting that to zero. It is not a dynamic problem. It's not changing. It's just kind of continuously moving. Okay, so hopefully that's clear to everyone. Uh, I didn't say this at the beginning, but I'm, I'm more than happy to take questions as I'm going because I think it'll be, uh, if anything isn't clear, please let me know and I will make it clear as I'm going. So let us go ahead and switch now and do some code. 
So hopefully everyone following along, you have spun up an instance of uh, Julia Hub and have Julia Sim running. Um, just in case, I, I'll just show real quick how that works. So if you log into Julia Hub, you'll see Julia Sim right here. You can simply uh, launch and then connect to an instance. And when you do that, you'll have VS Code running in your browser, which is a very cool thing. Um, you can also, of course, do this uh, locally. Uh, but the advantage that Julia Sim in Julia Hub gives you is that all of the packages that you needed are already preloaded and in the system image that Julia is running. So let's go ahead and pull up the starter code that we need which is some using statements. So this is what we're going to be using in today's workshop, model and toolkit, of course. And then we're going to be using differential equations, which is what we need to solve the problems that we're going to be creating with modeling toolkit. And then we can load plots to go ahead and visualize the, the results. So. Let us go ahead and I'll just copy paste in the problem that I just demonstrated, that I just uh, showed in the presentation. So these are the set of equations that I had on screen. And I actually was showing four equations and four unknowns, but uh, just to show that um, there's another way that we could do that by uh, pre-solving for one of the variables. And uh, so let me start now from the beginning. So in this problem, we have parameters and we have variables. And in modeling toolkit, you're pretty much always going to go through the process of first defining parameters, then defining variables, then defining equations. And then you're going to put that together in some kind of system. It's not required that you have to do it in that order, but I do find that that to be a uh, a good best practice. So the parameters that we have is the area of the actuator. This is our target velocity. Uh, like I said, we want to target the, the actuator moving at one meter per second. And we have a damping coefficient. This is the source pressure is 300 bar. The return pressure is zero. The density will be 1,000. This is the... Um, coefficient of the orifice that was given to us by the manufacturer. This is the mass of the actuator. And as I said, it's steady state, so acceleration is set to zero. The parameters that were, or the, I'm sorry, the variables that we're solving for um, are, as I had highlighted, the pressures, P1 and P2, and most importantly, the orifice area. This is the problem that we're really after. And as you can see, Defining parameters and variables is done with this keyword. Um, and you have an option of simply listing the parameters that you would like. Or as you can see, as I've done here, you can go ahead and give them values. Uh, the difference that that makes is comes at the end when you assemble the system. So you can either pre, you know, give it the beginning or you can give it at the end. Um, and so what I'm going to demonstrate, I always find it easiest, if you know things at the beginning, go ahead and put it in here. That makes your life easier uh, as, as you go through the problem. So parameters are you giving, these are values that are uh, constants, but can be changed later. I'm going to demonstrate that after we solve the problem. Uh, variables are um, something that can change, right? So. OK, so we have our parameters, our variables. And let me go ahead and run these. And what I want to demonstrate is that these are now symbolic terms. So if I type, um, if I type A, for example, down here, it's not going to say, it's not going to give me a result of 0 0.1. Uh, it's just going to say A, because this is a symbolic term. By the way, is this? Big enough, or should I zoom in a little bit here? Maybe I should zoom in. 
make it a little bit more clear at home. Yep, I think with zoomed in, I think that that's a good size. Okay, thanks, Chris. So, um, so these are symbolic terms. So instead of inputting u as an equation here, I just wanted to leave it out here just to demonstrate that what I'm going to do here is just define it as a symbolic expression. So when, when I say, what is u, it's not calculating the values that I put here. It's giving me a symbolic expression. And just so you know, what that's coming from, the, the back end to modeling toolkit is something called symbolics.jl. You don't need to know that, but symbolics.jl is, is what allows all this to happen. And what modeling toolkit is doing for you is allowing you to assemble your uh, problems uh, in a very easy way. OK, so we have a symbolic expression for u. So when I put u in here, basically, it's just going to be substituting this into the equations. And that allows me to just have three equations and three variables. Doesn't really matter how you do it. Um, I'm just doing that as a demonstration so you can see how all this works. OK, so let's go ahead and evaluate our equations. You can see we now have a vector of symbolic equations. And in Modeling Toolkit, um, a common uh, issue is that you need to remember that when you're defining symbolic equations, you need to use the, I think this is called the tide uh, symbol. Please correct me if I said that wrong. I, <clears throat> that's what I always call it. Um, this is representing equals to or an, or an inequality, right? Um, so if you type equals here and evaluate that, that's going to give you an error, um, which I'm very used to seeing because I make that mistake a lot. So just remember uh, to replace that with the tide. Uh, OK, so we have our equations. Now let's go ahead and solve uh, this. So the way what we're going to do is build a nonlinear system. So like I said, this is steady state. Nothing is changing in time. This is just a set of equations that we want to solve. And what goes into the nonlinear system is the equations, the variables, and the parameters. And one other nice feature that comes with Modeling Toolkit is that you can gather the parameters um, by assigning them to a variable here. Uh, Alternatively, you can simply list them here in an array. Uh, but that that is another, uh, this is another best practice uh, because it is very easy to kind of, as, as you're evolving your problem, you're adding parameters, changing the variables. Uh, it's, it's nice and easy to keep it, uh, to find in a variable up here so that you always have the most recent set of parameters and variables that are going into your system. OK, so um, that's it. We have equations, variables, parameters. That assembles into, as you can see here, a uh, nonlinear system. It says we have three equations, three states, and these parameters with the defaults. Now we want to go ahead and solve that. So we. Um, yeah, so let me go ahead and just copy these two guys. So the next step, so the process with anything in the SciML ecosystem is always assemble a system, assemble a problem, and solve the problem. So it's a really uh, clean API for being able to uh, yeah, yeah, it makes a lot of sense to me. You want your system, you want your problem, you solve the problem. Uh, so that's the next step is create a problem from the system. And in this case, all I'm going to be doing is feeding it the system and then two blank uh, entries. These, these two entries here are intended for initial conditions and for parameters. So if you wanted to, like I said in the beginning, you can either supply values at the start of your problem, or you can supply them when you're assembling the problem. And the way you do that is using, um, so let's say we wanted to set P1 
So 200 bar, you can do that like this. And if you wanted to set like area to something else, you can do that like this. So that is um, the intention of these two inputs. So, and, and the nice thing about this is these are kind of like the initial defaults. These are the um, priority uh, values. So these are the values that are going to be used if, if this is what I did. Um, and 300 will be overwritten. OK, but let's not complicate two things, things too much. Let's just take the values that I've written. We have a problem. And we're going to solve the problem. And we are using differential equations.jl. A really nice feature of differential equations is that you don't need to specify in, in general cases. You don't need to tell solve anything other than solve problem. Um, differential equations is an ecosystem of all kinds of solvers. Uh, so for example, it, it includes something called ordinary Diffie-Q, uh, which is all your ODE solvers. Uh, if you were using just ordinary Diffie-Q, then you would have to go ahead and give a second argument here of which solver uh, you wanted to use. Um, but uh, differential equations makes this very easy. So you can see here that I got the solution, um, which is a vector of the states of the problem. And the states of the problem are listed here, P1, P2, AO, the orifice area. And that is what we were after right there. Um, One more thing that we can mention is that we have one additional thing that we can do here. Modeling Toolkit uh, offers something called structural structural simplify, which is almost uh, is always going to be a step that you're going to pretty much want to put into the process. I wanted to leave that out at first just to make it simple. You have system problem solve. However, after you assemble the system, you have this really cool ability now to simplify the problem. And um, essentially, what Structural Simplify is going to do is do all the math that it can automatically to simplify the problem into its most simplest form so that when it's solved, it's solved in the most numerically efficient way, or at least computational way. So when I run this, you can see that we went from a problem with three equations to a problem with one equation. And therefore, when I solve it now, uh, whoops. Let me change that to system. So now when I solve, I'm I have one uh, one answer, because the system has one variable um, or one state, which is just the orifice area. OK, so if I want to extract that value, I can give the solution object a index of the uh, variable that I'd like to know about, right? So in this case, I would like to get with the orifice area. And you might wonder, OK, but the solution now contains only orifice area. What if I wanted the other variables that I'm solving for? Well, that is also available, but it is in the form of what's now called an observable. So basically, what Structurally Simplified did was compress the problem down to what needs to be solved, and then moved everything else to algebraic expressions, which are called observables. So the solution object makes it very clean and easy to be able to extract those observables, even though when you look at the what the information contained in it, it's just that one variable. It does all this work under the hood to go ahead and run those algebraic expressions and get you um, any variable you're looking for. And that also includes uh, the parameters, which maybe seems a little silly, but it can be extremely useful to know that you have this object that gives you all of the information that 
your problem is made up of, it's all contained in this one object so that later down the road, like if you imagine if you ran in batch a hundred of these uh, and you had a hundred different solutions, well, now you have all of that information contained in one object so that if you were changing parameters, for example, well, now you can easily find out, okay, what was the parameter that goes with this solution and this variable? Okay, so uh, hopefully that's clear to everybody. Um, now let's talk about what about changing parameters, right? Um, as I said, when you assemble the problem, you have the ability to change the variable initial conditions, or you can change the parameters. Um, if you want to do a batch process where you run through lots of different parameters, uh, what you can, what you ought to do is assemble a problem and then simply remake it, uh, you, changing only the bits that you want to change. And that is the most um, memory efficient way to, to go about that. So what I'm going to do here as just an example is, what if you wanted to see what the orifice size was for uh, different velocity limits. So for this problem we solved for just one case where velocity was set to one, but uh, we could easily go through a full range of velocities. Uh, so let's go from one to two, just as an example. And as you can see here, I'm gonna use the remake function and I'm gonna use the P keyword to represent the parameters. I'm just going to change that one parameter to a new value that remakes the problem. I can then solve the problem and then I can extract the result. Um, so I'll just build up a quick array that lines up with the velocity limits that, that we're going to go through here. So let me just go ahead and run that. And not the most interesting plot in the world, but you just kind of demonstrates the, the idea that uh, as we change the velocity limit, so Basically, if we had a higher limit, that would correspond to a higher or, or larger orifice size. Yeah, pretty obvious, but just as a demonstration of what is possible here. OK, so um, we have uh, a orifice area that looks like this, 0. 0.00094, right? Um, that is what we believe to be at this point, we're like, what's going to work for us, right? That is the, that is the engineering solution. But what if we want to check to see, does that really work? If we were to simulate this in time, uh, do we really limit the velocity to one meter per second? So let's go ahead and move to that. So what I'm going to do is copy paste. And like I said, all this code exists. In, in the Git repository. So you should be able to um, easily copy, paste, and follow along yourself. So what we're going to do now is involve time. Um, and in Modeling Toolkit, when you're going to involve time, you're going to want to involve differentials, most likely. Uh, so that is always kind of the requirement at the beginning of, of your Modeling Toolkit problem uh, is to define a differential. Now, this is something that um, may be uh, coming as a built-in already exists. Uh, but at the moment, I believe this is kind of a requirement that you can choose what you want to make your time variable, and then you can choose what you want to make your differential function. Uh, it's pretty standard to just do a small t and a capital D. Uh, most of the code you're going to look at is going to do that. But that's not a requirement. You can call this whatever the heck you want. And it's not a requirement to do just time, by the way. Um, it is also possible to do partial differential equations where you have differentials of more than just time. Uh, but that's just a teaser for a, a future <laughs> workshop. For now, let's just keep things simple and just look at time. So we have our uh, parameters and variables and before I get ahead of myself, let me switch back to this to just explain what we're doing. So in the steady state case, we cared about solving for the orifice area. Now we know the orifice area, 
Now we want to know what does the actuator do? What is X, right? So our, our variable that we're solving is going to move from the orifice area. That's now an input. And now we want to solve for the position of the actuator. So we, we essentially have the same equations. We're just switching what we're solving for. And that is what we hopefully have reflected here in the code is essentially the same equations, um, but the list of variables has changed. Um, and another important thing is that our variables are now a function of our independent uh, variable, which is time or t. Okay, the same idea as before, we're setting values for parameters. And as you can see, we have now uh, set the orifice area uh, to what we found in the previous step. Um, another cool thing that we can do here is that initial conditions don't have to be a value, they can be an expression. Uh, this is one of the things I really appreciate about modeling toolkit is that uh, what I have written here, for example, is that the acceleration at time zero is actually a function of, of the pressures that I'm going to be uh, solving or, or inputting to the system, right? So I don't have to put a value here and constantly, if I'm going to change this pressure, I don't have to then go in and update this value. I just put an expression that way it's done automatically for me. Okay, so let's go ahead and just execute these lines. Again, I have an ex a symbolic expression for u. And then we have our equations. Now, there's something different here about our equations. As, as I write here, uh, I'm kind of making this a little bit simpler in written form than it really is. I'm, I'm treating x as, as a single unknown. Um, but what it is is a differential variable, right? So it's actually kind of three. Uh, variables. It's x, it's velocity, or it's position, velocity, and acceleration, excuse me. So that's x, x dot, and x double dot. And that's exactly why uh, I actually have five variables here. I have position, velocity, acceleration. And a, good, a best practice in modeling toolkit is to define your differentials in, in such a way um, so that you can kind of just not really focus on the complication of, 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 of your differential equations. <laughs> it's the best way I can put it. So I always, I always just start with my differentials. So if I have, if I have something like X where I know I'm going to have, uh, all the derivatives of it, I go ahead and assemble them at the beginning of my equation. So the differential of X is equal to X dot. The differential X dot is X double dot. You know, it's, it's very straightforward in that way. Uh, OK, and then the rest of the equations are pretty much just as I had written them previously. And now that we have all that defined, just like we did before, let me copy paste. Now we can assemble an ODE system. So previously, it was a nonlinear system. It was pretty much the same thing, except it didn't have an independent variable. So that's the difference now is that we have our equations. We're telling the ODE system what is the independent variable. And then we're giving the variables and the parameters. And it's as simple as that. And then we're going to run structural simplify to simplify that. And as you can see, that compresses the five equations down to two equations. And um, now our problem is needs one more piece of information. Um, the order here is we have our system, we have our initial conditions, which again, I already specified here, so I don't need to give them here. We need to now give a time span, right? Since this is an ODE problem that involves time, we need to say like, okay, well, then what span of time are we solving for? And then the final input is the parameters. That can be blank in this case. OK, and then we solve it. And one thing that I can show is, uh, as I said, we don't need to give the solve step the solver. 
um, differential equations can determine that automatically. And if you were curious about which solver was used, we have that information also stored in the, in the solution object. So I think that is stored here. No, I'm sorry, dot alg. Okay, so yeah, there's a lot here. Um, but what differential equations did for us is chose a composite algorithm, which means it's actually using multiple solvers or it's attempting to use multiple solvers. Um, and I can see here it's using TSIT5 and somewhere here, Rosenbrock 23. Um, and I think what this is telling us is which, uh, at each time step, which algorithm was used uh, to solve. Chris, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's what's happening here. Um, OK, just a little bit of detail what's under the hood. So uh, this, is, I'm, this is a very cool thing, by the way, the composite algorithm. Um, this is kind of giving you the best of both worlds. If you have a um, problem that goes through stiff areas and non-stiff areas, uh, what this does is it switches solvers automatically for you so that it can solve the problem in the most optimal way. Something that I use um, in the models that I work on, and I find that to be a very, uh, it, it can really accelerate your, your, your models in some cases. Uh, okay, so now we have a solution. We probably want to like do something with that, take a look at it, right? Um, so now let's go ahead and make some plots. Um, I'm going to do this the hard way first. The solution object, now that we're doing an OD system, contains the time uh, vector. And what that is useful for is now you know which time steps were solved for. So when we run solve without any other inputs, the default is to solve the problem in the most efficient way, which means it's going to be doing an adaptive time stepping solution. Um, it's going to determine the best size time steps it can make and try to march from through your time span in the most quickest, most efficient way. Uh, so therefore, if you're going to plot your solution, you need to know what were the time points that are that each solution point um, is at. Uh, so I'm going to yeah, I'm going that's my x variable, my y variable. I'm plotting again. I'm just going to index using the symbolic term that I, I want to plot. So in this case, I want to plot the position. Um, and that looks like this, yeah? The other way you can do this is Modeling Toolkit has preloaded recipes for the plots.jl package. So the other way you can do that is to simply specify which variable you want to solve using the IDXS keyword. Uh, and you can see in that case, it's doing more than just plotting is more, doing more than what I just did in the previous line. It's actually kind of uh, interpolating and giving you a nice, smooth uh, result. Uh, OK, so that's our position. That's our velocity. And this is the whole point of this exercise. We wanted to see, OK, with this, this orifice size, is it going to give us what we're looking for? Our, the goal is to hit a maximum of one meter per second. Uh, you can see that that's what we got. So um, we now feel more confident about our solution. You can see that this is negative one meter per second. That is because we define the problem such that when this is moving down, I defined x as up. So that's it's moving in the negative uh, when it's coming down. Uh, if you wanted to plot uh, this in the positive, you can simply change the um, the expression. So the, the, just to add more detail about what this is, the symbolic indexing is not just 
an index of the variable that you want. It's actually an expression. Um, so you could actually do, so I, yeah, so I can say, what is the inverse of that? So now I can plot in the positive, which makes it a little bit nicer to look at. Um, or you could even do something more complicated, like plot the, um, the flow rate, right? Which would be x dot times a. So that is also an extremely cool thing about um, the solution object and what you can do with it and being able to do that with the plots package. Uh, okay, so that is our position velocity. The acceleration looks like that. And you can also do several terms at once. So if you wanted to look at the pressures, they start, P1 starts at 300 bar and P2 starts at zero. And then they are both gonna merge together um, at some mid pressure. So that's what we would expect in a system like that. Uh, okay. Um, let me just see if we have any questions. Okay, this is a good question um, about converting a nonlinear problem to an ODE problem. Um, this is actually something that I'm kind of curious about. It looks like Chris is actually typing an answer, but uh, I do believe that you can maybe, I think the answer is yes. Um, I do think it's also possible to do the other way. If you had an ODE system, I think you can just solve a steady state point and convert it to a nonlinear system. Um, however, I don't know how to do that. So <laughs> I'll just say that that is possible, I believe. Um, and we'll leave that for a, a later webinar. Yeah, so I'll, I'll chime in on that. I just was finishing the, the, the writing on that. Yeah, so sure. um, doing it in the other direction, uh, there's a lot of tooling for. So for example, um, you know, if you define an ODE system, you can always just uh, call steady state problem on that. So if you, you know, if you define an ODE problem, you can always put a, an ODE problem, uh, a steady state problem over that. And um, then that defines the steady state problem of, you know, where does the derivative equal zero, that nonlinear system. And then for that, then that, that brings it right over to the realm of nonlinear solve. And uh, nonlinear solve has the documentation for then, you know, um, some of the special methods that can be involved in, the, in that certain scenario. So converting from an ODE to to a nonlinear system um, is relatively straightforward. Converting from a nonlinear uh, system, you know, and everything time independent to suddenly time things time dependent, there is no tooling for that. But um, there there is an issue that has been open about that of you know if if I if I have uh, constructed a bunch of variables already, how do I suddenly turn them all into be time dependent and substitute everything through? Right. Um, there is no current tooling on that, but there is an issue, and we do plan to be getting to that in, in the future. Okay, very good. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so um, hopefully at the, up to this point, everything is fairly clear to everybody. Um, and hopefully I haven't lost you in the physics and the, the fluid dynamics of the problem. Um, but uh, the next step here is that we want to do, we want to go to the next level of complexity. Uh, because maybe you presented this work uh, to your manager and they said, okay, that's great, but we're dealing with an extremely high pressure hydraulic system and doing this in the incompressible form is not enough. We want to see a higher level of, of complexity and, and to the actual compressible uh, mechanics that are happening here. So Adding complex compressibility, as you might know, if you're if you're a thermal fluids engineer, is going to make this a lot a lot more complicated. Um, we're going to go from a system that's no longer just four equations; it's going to become a lot more equations uh, because we can't just assume that the flow rate uh, is the area times the velocity of the actuator. So the flow what's coming through the orifice is maybe not going to be equal to what the flow is coming into the actuator, and the and the flow deep into the actuator. Those can be three very different things. So I'm going to now introduce a causal modeling because I think that is a great way to uh, simplify complex problems like this. Now we can worry about one piece of the puzzle at a time rather than trying to assemble all the equations together that you would need by hand. 
to do a problem like this. Now you can just do it piece by piece. And um, yeah, so on that, we're going to move to a causal model. So the first piece that we're going to want to define, if we're going to build this as a compressible problem, is a volume uh, component. Because the volume component is what is an actuator is basically two volumes, right? There's a volume on each side of the actuator. And if we want to make this compressible, then we have to define how the mass flow into the volume uh, is changing in time based on not just the volume, um, the, the, the geometry, not just the geometry, but the compressibility of the density of the volume of the hydraulic fluid. So that means we need to worry about the derivative of both the density and the volume. And uh, uh, this is not an easy thing to do, right? If you were to try to assemble these equations by hand, <clears throat> this gets quite complex quite quickly. So um, that's the fluid bit of a volume component. But we want to be able to have um, also some mechanical forces uh, so that we have a moving uh, face. So imagine that this is a cylinder and, and the end, the cap of the cylinder is able to move. Um, so on the left, we have a port that supports the fluid coming in and out. And on the right, we have a, a, a moving face. And I'm drawing here um, two points that, re re that represent connections. Um, and that I'm going to talk about in a minute, but that's fundamental to, to how the a causal modeling works, is that you have able to assemble your equations that are going to communicate with those connecting points. So the, the fluids, we worry about the, the mass flow in and out of this port, and for the moving face, we worry about the forces uh, communicating with this point. So to assemble an actuator, then, what we're going to have is two volumes connected to each other in, opposing, uh, in an opposing manner. Each have flow coming in and out of them. And then we're going to connect a mass. And as you can see, I'm drawing here that these the mechanical bits of all three of these guys are going to be connected together. That means they're going to all move together, and they're all going to sum the forces together. OK, so let us go ahead and look through the code now about that. So as I said, that the key to a causal modeling is that you have to have connectors. So we're going to have a port to represent the fluid connections. And we're going to have a flange to represent the mechanical connections. Uh, the name is just, um, this is, I, I think, originates from uh, what they use in Medelica, but this could be, the name doesn't matter. You could call this whatever, whatever you want. Um, and let me just quickly point to this link here. The documentation for the Modeling Toolkit Standard Library has a section which goes through the details of what these connectors are all about. It talks about the theory that um, regardless of what kind of system you're talking about, electrical, mechanical or fluids, uh, the same kind of concept is going to exist about how these connectors are defined and kind of the theory behind them. So I'm not going to go through this for this presentation. Uh, that is just to explain why do each of these have two variables and why is one of them labeled flow? Um, if you go to this link and read through, that'll That'll make more sense to you. OK, so now that we have our connectors defined, let me go ahead and just execute that code. We can go ahead and start defining a component. So a component is very similar to what we just did. Um, it's going to define parameters, and then variables, and then equations. But we introduce a new concept, which is defining also components. So in this case, the orifice is going to contain 
the same equation that we had before, but it's going to connect to a port. And that's the connector that we just defined, right? So the port defines a mass flow and a pressure. And so all we got to do to define a component is wire up that information to our fundamental equation that gives the fundamental physics of what this component is. Now there's two different ways to do this in modeling toolkit. Um, there is the uh, clean, easy way, and then there's the more advanced way. I'm gonna go over the clean, easy way, uh, but just so you know and understand, and for people that have been playing around with modeling toolkit for some time, uh, this is a, a new evolving feature. And that feature is, is using this MTK model uh, macro. So if you use MTK model macro, all you need to do is define a parameter block, a variable block, an equation block, and a component block. And that's it. Um, if you're going to do it the old style, then you need to do a bit more work that looks a lot like what I did here where you're defining OD system. Um, but I'll just leave it at that. Uh, OK, so we have an orifice. Um, let me go ahead and just execute that. Uh, what that means now is that we can, um, we now have a function called uh, orifice available to us. So if I said orifice equals orifice down here, you can see that what I've what I have is a um, a model of an orifice. Uh, it has states, it has parameters. Um, and note, I had to use the at named macro. If I'm going to just call a component by itself, then it needs to be given a name. Um, so you, yeah, I think if I don't do that, you'll, yeah, it's going to tell you it wants a name. So that's how you give it a name. And um, we can't really do much with it at this point because we need to connect things to it. Uh, to those two ports, we need to connect these up to something, right? So let's go ahead and continue on. So now let's go ahead and define the really nasty component. I shouldn't say nasty, the more complicated bit, um, which is the volume. So same idea. Uh, we have parameters, we have variables. And we have components. And just like I was showing you before, the volume component is going to have uh, a, one port for the, for the hydraulic fluid coming in and out. And it's going to have another connector that is the uh, mechanical translation um, connector. And these equations are what I was showing on screen previously. Um, this is the mass flow balance. So we have. R represents the density times the change in volume plus the change in density times the current volume. Um, and notice how you know, easy that is. I don't have to do a ton of math uh, to integrate this equation into a flat system of equations to solve the full system all at once. I just need to be concerned about like what is a volume, what is the physics of the volume, and simply write down what are those physics. And it's very straightforward in this way. Um, I'll make one other note here is that uh, it's a good practice is to pay very close attention to your initial conditions um, and be very deliberate about that. Like when you're defining your variables, it's a very good idea to just Make sure you're giving some good thought to, to, to what is happening at time zero. What do you want your system doing at the very beginning? Um, and make sure you're kind of thinking about that very clearly. And so what I've done here is I know that I want to start my system from rest. And therefore, I know that I want my mass flow to just be zero at time zero. I don't want there to be any velocity. And I know that. Um, the pressure and the position of the actuator 
are something that I don't know at time zero. This is something I'm going to have to set later on. So I make I make kind of an interface for my component by saying, and this is just something I'm doing for this uh, webinar is a practice of specifying, I want my initial conditions to be given. If I have a prime here, then that's kind of saying a reminder to myself, like this is something that I need to set when I consume this component later. So you're gonna see how that works in a minute. Okay, so there's our volume component. Um, now we need a mass component. And this guy is fairly simple. Um, all we need to do is define, again, the physics, the fundamental physics of what is, what is mass. Um, and that in, is just Newton's second law, right? Mass times acceleration equals the sum of forces. The forces are gonna come from the connector um, and the position or the, the velocity of the mass is gonna come from the connector. <clears throat> and so to get the um, acceleration, then we simply just need to take the derivative of that uh, velocity that comes from the connector. And then we have Newton's second law. Um, fairly, fairly straightforward for the mass. So now that we have a mass and we have a volume, we can make an actuator. And again, that is going to, you know, in diagram form, it's going to look like this. We're going to have two volumes and a mass, and we're going to connect them all together. And that is essentially what we, all we need to make an actuator. So let me go ahead and show you how that works. So an actuator is going to <clears throat> have the components defined of now not just connectors, but now we're going to be consuming actual components. So like I said, two volumes and a mass. And um, I am setting now the initial conditions for the for the each volume. So they're going to set it, start at two different pressures. So I have P1 and P2. Um, and each one is going to be in opposing directions. So volume one is going to be changing in the negative direction. Um, it's going against X and volume two is gonna move with X. So that's why we define them that way. And then we just have a mass component. And as you can see, I'm paying very close attention to my initial conditions. So I have two pressures that I'm going to be starting at two different uh, values. That means that the force on the mass at time zero is going to be, uh, it's not going to be zero. It's going to be some value. And I can define that as, like I said before, that can still be defined as an expression. And then we're just going to expose um, the ports that the fluid can come in and out of. And we're going to expose uh, a mechanical connection to this component. So now that we have every, all the physics defined previously in our components, we don't have to worry about defining uh, all those equations and putting them all together by hand. Now all we have to think is, is in terms of components, just like I show here. That's This is now how we're thinking. How do we connect these guys together? And that's exactly what, what you're going to, what I'm doing here in my equations. It's just making connections. The volume port connects to the exposed port. Same thing for port two. And then as I show in the diagram, this is where we connect all the mechanical parts. And that's it. Uh, OK, so let me just make sure I've executed these guys. So by the way, I'm just hitting Shift Enter. Um, Julia Sim in Julia Hub has uh, the extension for Julia already loaded. And that extension is absolutely brilliant. It allows you to just walk through your code and do shift enter to evaluate uh, line by line. Just in case anybody didn't know that, um, that is, I'm a huge fan of that feature. Um, and so what we, we finally need, just need two last bits. I won't go through the detail, but we just need a source to set the pressure. And of course we had a damper component in, in our model there too. So let's just go ahead and define those. 
And now finally, let's get to uh, assembling that full system. Which, uh, as I said, we have an actuator, we have two sources, we have a damper, and we have the two orifices. And we're just connecting things together, and that's it. Um, what that looks like is this. So this is the beautiful thing about a-causal modeling is that we have a diagram that looks like this. We have an orifice, we have an actuator, we have another orifice. In, in a-causal modeling and component-based modeling, our diagram of, of the math that we're assembling can look almost identical to, to how we would draw it on paper, right? Um, if you were gonna kind, kind of map out what is your system, it looks the same. And just a quick note, so, or quick teaser, this functionality, you, you may be thinking like, oh, well, why, why are we doing this in code? If I can just make a diagram, it wouldn't it be cool if I could just do that? Um, well, of course, that is coming. Um, that is a feature that will be in Julia Hub very soon. Um, and that's exactly the point of this too, right? Is that you should be able to just kind of work in terms of, uh, code, but then when you're working in the system level, you should be able to just visualize what the heck is your system. Okay, so um, there is our full system, and let's go ahead and assemble it. So previously, I had um, done two steps at this point. I had made an ODE system, and then I ran Structurally Simplify. Um, the, uh, that can all be compressed into one step using the MTK build macro. Um, so what that's going to do is, is kind of the steps I showed before. That's just going to do it all, all in one, all under the hood. And as you can see, that is going to give us a system that has 10 equations and 10 states. If you wanted to see what was the system that we started with, that is possible. Uh, as I showed before, you can just say at named and now you can get um, the raw system that hasn't been simplified. And you can see putting all of that together, that's actually 54 equations, okay? So um, you can imagine that that's essentially what we would have had if to put down by hand if we were assembling this without using component-based system. And we can visualize those equations if you're interested and want to know what the heck is going on. Oops, equa equations. Um, you can actually go ahead and access what those equations are. Um, which is a nice thing to be able to check, make sure that what's happening under the hood is truly what you expect. Um, and just to give you one little extra layer of detail is that this is a, kind of has a pretty print form um, where you can kind of visualize this in a way that that is human readable. But there, what, what it's really doing, uh, you can see when you ask for full equations, Full equations means give me the equations that it's actually solving where it's implement, inserted all the, the um, simplifications uh, and all the observables. And, and so I just want to make sure everybody understands that there's, there's kind of two different forms to look at the equations because this may be printing your equations with different states than it says it's solving. So that gets a little bit confusing. So, so just know that that's, that exists. Okay, so enough detail about what's going on under the hood. Let's go ahead and solve our problem and see what is happening. So now that we have our system, we can go ahead and assemble a problem. I'm gonna, just like before, this is the same. We have our system initial conditions. Our initial conditions are already defined. Just like I said before, they're already defined um, as we define the components. Um, I'm giving them values. So I think, yeah. So here, when I define the system, I'm going ahead and just put the initial conditions 
here at the system level, but you don't have to do it there. You could give it at this stage. Uh, same thing with the parameters. And let's go ahead and now solve our problem. OK, so um, what I would love to be able to do here is just like we were doing before, just go ahead and solve the problem. But um, we are going to get this message. It says it's unstable. Now, this, um, this is kind of expected in this case because we're dealing with an extremely stiff hydraulic problem. And uh, these are never easy to solve. And almost every engineering problem, any real life problem, is going to be a DAE, meaning it has a mix of, of algebraic constraints with uh, differential equations. These are never easy problems to solve. Um, and uh, it, it, so I'm just going to go ahead and show whenever, whenever that comes across um, my desk, which happens all the time, um, I have a couple tricks to go ahead and what you know? What do you do when you get that message, right? So one of the things that I like to do is use a nonlinear Newton um, setting, which is kind of a brute force solver. So basically, what I do is I I say stop checking for di divergence. Always new means update the Jacobian with every um, iteration, and I introduce a rela relaxation factor. So this is something that will really help with these very stiff problems. It'll help get through those really tough parts to solve. And the way you use that is that you just, um, any of the solvers which ask for a nonlinear solve keyword, you can give it those settings. So um, implicit Eulers is you know, the standard um, DE solver that can be used. Um, so that's the first half. The second half is that um, turning off adaptive time stepping can also be very helpful whenever you have a very challenging problem. So I'm going to turn that off, give it a time step. And finally, um, I'm going to say, just don't worry about solving for the initial conditions. Um, cause that's, a, that's another reason why you're going to get an unstable or instability detected message is that when it's trying to assemble the initial conditions that the numerics are very stiff and the, the solver has a hard time pushing through. So, so yeah, this is this is in the code. If you're ever having a hard time solving a problem, like this is a good uh, first thing to try. So let's go ahead and run through that and you see that, okay, good. We're now getting a success code when we solve. So that's the first um, uh, strategy. The second strategy, is to pay attention to your tolerances and to use the champagne um, collocation initial uh, initialization algorithm. The difference between this guy and the default is the no the states that it's trying to initialize. So the default uh, initialization algorithm is just going to change your algebraic variables. It's going to leave your differential variables set as they were. Um, this guy goes ahead and just looks at the entire problem and tries to satisfy an initial condition that works for the whole thing. So that can, you know, open up the possibilities and allow you to push forward. And um, this will also work and give us a successful, um, oh no, we got a max iters. Okay. <laughs> Live demo is always going to have problems. Anyway, we don't need to worry about that. Uh, we're just going to worry about the successful solve using the um, nonlinear Newton solver. OK, yeah, so Brad, now, Brad I, can, I can see yeah. that the, the reason why you got implicit over there is because you're using a very low tolerance with, uh, well, the re, uh, you're using a very low tolerance with implicit Euler. A low uh -huh. order method will not do well at giving you a very, uh, very highly accurate solution. So when you use an adaptive method with a low tolerance, you'll generally want to use, say, you know, something like a Rodos 5P or, or FBDF, which will do much better at getting you a high, uh, high accuracy solution. OK. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, just as you said. 
Okay, so um, this is this is a perfect uh, resource. So if you, it, I'll, I'll make sure that this is in the repository so that the, for me, this happens all the time where the, I'm, I never seem to get easy problems to solve. They're always hard. <laughs> so it's nice to have a bag of tricks. Uh, if you get unstable, that doesn't mean that it's not something that can be solved. You can push forward and solve these problems. It's just gonna take a little bit more finesse uh, and paying very close attention to what's happening. Um, I will also say that uh, another thing that's very uh, likely to happen, uh, or what I wanna say is don't be discouraged. Um, the most challenging programming that can be uh, done is modeling, uh, I, in my opinion. The, you're trying to solve a, a whole set of equations all at once, and it either works or it doesn't, right? And there's never going to be an error message that gives you, um, tells you exactly what the problem is, uh, because it's not doing one thing at a time. It's doing the full set of equations at the same time, right? Uh, so it's very possible that you, you have one sign that is wrong in your equations, and that's going to blow up the whole problem. Um, so it, it can be extremely tedious and, and you need to be, um, yeah, don't be discouraged. Make sure that you keep uh, going through your, your system and, and asking the question, um, you know, do I, do I have the right initial conditions? That's definitely an important thing to touch on and pay very close attention to the signs. Um, and I did make a note here, um, that you need, like here when I'm making the volume component, uh, I needed to pay very close attention to the signs here that the mass is entering the volume, but the force is leaving. So I had to make sure that I have a positive here and a negative here. And um, even though I'm, you know, have been doing this for a long time, I can tell you when I put this demo together, um, I spent quite a bit of time on that little bit right there. <laughs> so don't be discouraged. Um, and another thing to note is that what an advantage that acausal modeling gives you is that you can you can start small, right? Um, you can define your volume component and then just assemble a problem that is just using your volume component. Make sure it's doing what you want it to do. So that is kind of the the tips for moving forward whenever you're having a problem. I would never recommend you try to assemble a full complex system all at once and then just try it. Um, you're going to be very frustrated uh, trying to move forward that way. Okay, enough uh, enough with the lectures. Let's go ahead and uh, go ahead and look at the results. So we are now solving a compressible system, and what we see is very different from what we had before. Actually, the best thing to look at is. The thing that we really care about is the velocity of the actuator. So previously, let me plot what we had previously first. So previously, we had something that looked like this. Um, and I'm doing a very different time span. So you can't even see what's happening there. If I change the limbs to this. This is what the velocity looked like before. It it's, um, went to negative one, and then it stayed at, at negative one. That was, that was the whole point, right? Um, so now let's compare what our solution looks like now that we've introduced the complexity, complexity of compressibility. Now you can see something very different is happening. Um, now the compressibility of the oil is allowing the mass to actually go much higher than um, uh, one meter per second. And what's happening is kind of acting like a spring. So we're starting the simulation with a very high pressure differential at time zero. So we're kind of smacking that actuator. And what it's doing is it's just ringing. Um, and eventually it's uh, arriving at one meter per second, but it's taking quite a bit of time to get there. Um, so that uh, kind of shows you a, a good demonstration of, of how we can continue to move through the complexity and how we can kind of see 
the difference that that makes. Um, let's see. So we still have, <laughs> I think we have eight minutes left, right? So um, now probably a good time for me to pause and, and see if there's any questions that I should address. Okay, looks like we have a question about system size. Okay, good. We have a good question about this size that is supported. Um, the I, I don't think that there's a, a specific limit to the size. Um, it's all about compilation, right? And we do have something called Julius M compiler. We did a webinar about that last week, which kind of addresses this question. Um, but essentially, we should be able to push through uh, much more, uh, much larger scaled problems using Julius Sim compiler than is possible with some other systems. That is still needs uh, some more references and some more work for me to more intelligently answer that question. But uh, the, the, the idea is that we should be able to give some very good scaling uh, with modeling toolkit. Yeah, let me uh, let me chime in for that. So yeah, sure. yeah so the Juliusm compiler is a new piece of the ecosystem, um, which was recently released, and it allows for the defining or or the better scaling of the compilation of modeling toolkit models. Right um, now, what it's able to improve the scaling of is problems which have certain structures. Right, and right now these structures are if you have uh, things like repeated components. So think, you know, for example, if you have uh, you know the same component showing if you have 200 uh, cell, uh, cells in a battery pack, or if you have a case like a partial differential equation, right? Um, what it's able to do is it's able to understand the structure and generate the code in a way that builds a loop. And by using a loop instead of just generating the large scale code, it's able to you know, basically turn the, the compilation time um, into something that's very that scales very well to large problems. Um, so there are some test cases that we have that are in the millions of equations that, that that showcase that this works out. Um, because again, you know, millions of equations when it's O of one is perfectly fine, right? So so the Julius Sim compiler is able to specialize on that kind of structure. It's also able to specialize in the structure of uh, uh, embedded linear system problems. So for example, like we see in multi-body systems, it can automatically handle those linear systems um, before the code generation time. And so for those kinds of structures, it's able to improve the, the co compilation to large, uh, to large systems. If you have a fully unstructured problem. Um, it cannot do something special at, uh, for, for that. But I think that most people who build large systems, they generally have some kind of repeated components. And then that's, you know, that's exactly what the Juliusm compiler handles. And there was a recently a webinar on this topic. And so you can go check out our webinars page for and, uh, and find uh, find more details on this. I'll also include a link for folks to be able to watch that webinar um, in the follow up email with the notes and things from this webinar. Okay, it looks like we have one more question. Can we add boundaries and constraints to variables? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, that is definitely something I didn't talk about in this um, first workshop. Um, there, the concept of, of events um, and um, yeah, continuous events, discrete events uh, are supported in modeling toolkit. And uh, using that, it is possible to, to assemble problems that have um, uh, constraints and um, the, the word, I'm, I'm losing it. But basically, in differential equations, there's a discussion about how to set up problems like that. And Modeling Toolkit ties into that and can support that um, for, for another webinar, for sure. Um, and probably yeah, so, Chris so, can give a better answer than Yeah, me. so the, there's the ability to be able to define um, what the domain of a solution variable is supposed to be. So for example, if you know that analytically, um, you know, the concentration of this chemical always has to be positive because negative concentrations of chemicals don't don't exist, right? Um, you can define that the domain of a variable is positive, um, and there are ways that that interacts with the solver. Um, so that way it can enforce this positivity, right? Now, I will say that, uh, that you know, when you use these tools, 
uh, you have to make sure that you set a domain that is actually true, right? You know, so for example, if you have a solution whose true solution goes negative, um, and you say, oh, but I want a solution to be positive, it will try really hard to be able to enforce positivity, but it will always, it will only ever give you a true solution. So what it'll do is it'll say, you know, max iters, it cannot solve this, you know, um, because it will just try hard, harder to get a more accurate solution. But if your accurate solution isn't truly positive, then it will, it will just fail, right? So, so there is tooling within the solvers to be able to say, you know, if this variable goes negative, then try to get a higher precision. So that way it stays positive, right? And, and if your true solution then is supposed to be positive, then it will then it will enforce these properties. So these are the things like is out of domain and the positive callback and general domain callback. Um, and I'll link uh, I'll, I'll link in the answer uh, how, how where the documentation is for for these kinds of features. Thank you, Chris. Um, so one last thing as we run out of time here that I didn't get to that I wanted to address um, is that you can go about doing your engineering problem as I addressed here, where we solve directly for the uh, orifice area. But wouldn't it be nice if we could uh, use the full complex a causal system to do the same? Um, and that is where something called an inverse problem comes into play. And that is where you use your system simulation in a optimization problem uh, where you can set constraints and um, solve for a target constraint, right? And so that is what Julia Sim Model Optimizer is another product that is available that that's what it's all about is, um, you know, as I showed the compressible systems a lot more com uh, complex than this um, incompressible system. And you could then, you know, have a much more confident solution to solving a problem like this if you do it in that way. Um, but there's no time to, to give an example of that here, uh, again, for, for another future webinar. So with that, um, I just want to say thank you to everyone who, who listened to me stumble, stumble through this. Um, and uh, please reach out if you have any questions in the future. Um, Modeling Toolkit is one of my favorite topics, so I'm always happy to talk about this. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Thank you, Brad, for presenting. And we will be sending a follow-up email with the materials we mentioned here, as well as a recording of this. And uh, I would encourage you to check in. This is our, our last webinar for 2023, but we're starting to post our 2024 schedule. And we're looking forward to a lot of great topics from, from the team. And I would encourage you to take a look. Thank you, Brad. Thanks everyone for attending. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Chris. Thanks everyone. Bye.